YouTube channel where we're always talking about ways to enforce purpose in your life. If this is your first time here, make sure you click that subscribe button. Don't forget to like this episode and leave me a comment below. Now, if you have been following along, you know that we are in the series where we are talking about how to master your wilderness seasons. So in episode one, we talked about really learning to shift our mind to recognize that God can and is and wants to produce good th things through every wilderness season that we walk through. We defined a little bit about what a wilderness season was. If you have not uh, listened to that episode, head on back to episode one, check that out. Or you can just hang out here as we are going to enter into episode two, where we're talking about what is God doing? Why is he allowing wilderness seasons. Now, we talked a little bit about how we know he's bearing fruit, how even in the middle of a desert, uh, he could be uh, planting a cypress tree, could be planting a box tree in the middle of a valley. He's making an open river that he does supernatural things within us. Um, and that part of that is learning how to set our mind on things above and not on earthly things. Uh, no longer looking at the things on our right and our left, but looking to God and expecting that he is producing fruit within us, even when we're in that season where we feel frustrated, are frustrated. The reality is no matter how much movement I have, I can't seem to make traction. So today we're going to be talking about some of the things specifically that God is doing in the midst of these wildernesses. And with that, we need to be willing to recognize that biblically, a lot of wilderness seasons for people that we see in the Bible were actually God authored. Um, now, whether your wilderness season is God authored or not, uh, what you can be sure of is that God is sovereign over it. So a lot of times we're like, oh, there's no way God could have authored this in my life. This is totally of the enemy or this is totally of my bad circum my bad um, decisions. And it's uh, it's an outcome of, of disobedience. Uh, it doesn't matter what you can know and what you can believe, and what you can trust in is that God is sovereign in the midst of whatever season you're in and, and that he wants to use the season for your good and for his glory. You've got to resolve that in your mind and conclude at the end of every night, no matter how much you wrestle with God, trying to figure out what is happening, is this good, how can this be good, why is God allowing this? What you have to conclude at the end of every night is, I have resolved that God is sovereign over every moment of my life and that all things he is working together for my good and his glory. Come on, somebody just needs to say that. My good, God's glory. God is always working for my good, his glory. God is always working for your good and his glory in your life. All right, so let's talk about some of these God-driven winters that we see throughout scripture. If you have your Bible, I want you to open it up to Hosea 2, verses 14 through 17. Now, if you are just wanting to listen, you can just listen, that's fine as well. It says, therefore, I behold, I will allure her and I will bring her into the wilderness. Now, what do we hear already that God is saying, I'm gonna allure her, the lover, the beloved, that's you, the beloved, I'm going to allure you into a wilderness and speak comfort to her. This doesn't seem to make any sense. You can speak comfort to me in my plethora. You can speak comfort to me in my achievements. But God, you don't need to drag me out into a wilderness just to speak comfort to me. But listen as it goes on and it says, I will give her vineyards from there. I will make her fruitful in the middle of a desert. Again, we see this conflicting um, concept of what we experience in the natural in a desert we wouldn't find a vineyard nobody would plant a vineyard in a desert that doesn't make sense but he's saying I'm going to allure her I'm going to allure you he's going to allure me into a wilderness into a desert in order to comfort me and to give me vineyards to make me fruitful to produce fruit again not around me but inside of me and from there the Valley of Achor will be as a door of hope. Now listen to me, this Valley of Achor, what it means is it's a valley of death. This space and this place that you're in that is not producing fruit, that has no life in it, 
that doesn't seem like you're making any headway. You can't see where you're going. You feel very lost. What he's saying is in this place, I will cause a doorway of hope to be released in you. It is not saying I'm going to take you out of the desert and then you will find your doorway of hope. He is saying, and the valley of Achor, this place of death will be as a door of hope. This is so important for us to get. Because again, we hear here that God is very intentional in how he uses the wilderness seasons in our lives. That in that space, he's teaching us that our hope is found in him. Our hope isn't found on our right and on our left. Our hope isn't found in our spouses, in our circumstances, in our jobs, in our paychecks. There is only one hope that will not disappoint. And the Bible tells us in, in Romans that that hope is in Christ alone. And then it goes on and it says, she shall sing from there. As in the days of her youth. Now watch the shift that begins to take. I'm going to lure her into a wilderness. I'm going to speak comfort to her. Some versions say I will speak tenderly to her in that place. And her valley of Achor will be as a doorway of hope. And she shall sing there. I will make her as fruitful as the vineyards. And it goes on and it says, as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt, remembering the freshness, the youthfulness of our relationship with the Lord. And it says, and it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me husband and no longer call me my master. Now, God is revealing in this, thing, in this place often in our wildernesses that I want to shift into a state of intimacy. I want you to recognize that you are loved in your wildernesses. I want to shift from where you see me as just a master in your life, where you see me as just a dictator in your life, where you see me as just a God in your life, and you see me as your husband. You see me as your lover, that you recognize that you are my beloved. In the voice, it says this, but once she has nothing, I'll be able to get straight through to her heart. And I will entice her and I will lead her out into the wilderness where we can be alone. And I will speak directly to her heart and I will win her back. Why does God often allure us into a wilderness because he wants to deepen our intimacy. He wants us to come to know him, his love and his love for us at a deeper, more intimate level. He wants to remove it. If you read in this passage, it goes on. It says in that place, I will remove from her the names of her bales. In other words, I will remove the things, the things upon her lips, the things in her mind, the things in her heart that have become gods to her, that have begun to navigate her life, that her affection is toward those things as opposed to her affection being towards me. So God often allows these wildernesses in our life because he wants to deepen our intimacy with us. He wants us to know that we are loved. I'm reminded of a story um, about a field full of flowers. And for those of you who have read my book, Mastering Your Seasons, I write about this story in the book. And uh, I write about how there was a story of a field full of flowers. And there were three signs in this field. And one was written in German and it said, picking the flowers is prohibited. And the other one was written in English. And it was like, please don't pick the flowers. And the last one was written in French. And it said, if you love the flowers, then you will not pick them. And I think this is a great example of often how we have our relationship with the Lord, where sometimes we feel like doing this is prohibited. If you do this, it is wrong. If you do this, you're going to hell. If you do this, you will be condemned. If you do this, you are disqualified for the blessings of the Lord. And on the other side of that, we err to the side of just trying to be pleasing to God and trying to work our way into the pleasures and the delight and the blessings of the kingdom. But the final sign is basically saying is the more you fall in love with God, the more it will become an organic desire in your life to just walk in his ways, to just walk in his commands. And so God allows these wilderness times. He allures us a lot of times into these spaces and places because he wants us to recognize the depths of his love, that he wants us to shift from living Christianity like this or feeling this condemnation or feeling this work in our life to I get to and because I am loved I'm going to and because I love him I want to 
And it removes that religious mentality from us the more we get to know that God is not my master. He is my lover and he is my husband. I talked a little bit in episode one about Jesus and how he would, was also driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. Again, another God-driven wilderness that we see here. Now, he was driven into the wilderness and the Bible says that he went in, and this is in Luke chapter 4, it says that he, was, he went into the wilderness filled with the Spirit, but he came out of the wilderness empowered by the Spirit. So one of the reasons why God will allure us into a wilderness is, is because he wants us to come into a deeper understanding of his love for us and he wants to deepen our intimacy but another reason why he, does, why he does it is he wants us to learn how to come into the empowerment of the Spirit, how to grow and stand against temptation, how to take a stand against the enemy. It was in that space and in that place that Jesus faced the enemy and he faced all of his fears and he had to really face that question, is God really good? And he began to recognize that by the Holy Spirit, there was an empowerment in him to be able to stand against the enemy and be able to stand against temptation. For a lot of us, our wilderness is facing temptation. Maybe it's facing addiction. Maybe it's facing depression. Maybe it's facing anger. Maybe it's facing pornography. But it's coming to this place where you feel the dryness. You feel the parchment in your life because of this thing in your life. And God, and, and it would be easy for us to say, look at what the enemy is doing in this space and in this place. But God is saying, if you let me, I want to teach you how to fight this thing, how to stand against this thing, how to be victorious over this thing, only by the Spirit of the living God. I've been reminded lately of the passage in Isaiah 59, 19, where it says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, and a lot of times the comma is there, and it says, the Spirit of the Lord raises a standard against it. In other places, it says, when the enemy comes in, comma, like a flood, the Spirit comes in against it, raises a standard against it. The Spirit is the one who fights. When you feel like the enemy is, whether he's coming in like a flood, what you need to recognize is equally like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord, the empowerment of the Spirit, the, the empowerment of the Spirit of the Lord, almost spoken tongues there, the empowerment of the Spirit of the Lord is what will come against that temptation is what will stand against Satan when he speaks to you. And so we learn the empowerment of the Word of God and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit while we are in those wilderness, wilderness places. And finally, in those places, we often are proven. We self-discover what's within us, the strength that we have, and all of these kind of go together because the more we recognize the love of God and that we are loved, the more empowered we become and the more we discover what is within us. In Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 4, now I'd like to remind you that the entire book of Deuteronomy is, is kind of like Moses's final speech to the Israelites after they have been in the wilderness all these years and they're about to finally enter into their promise. And he kind of gives this final um, exhortation to them. And that's the book of Deuteronomy. And so in verse eight or in chapter eight, verses two through four, he says, every commandment, which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which your, the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord, your God led you all these 40 years in the wilderness. Now listen to what it says to humble you and to test you, and to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Listen, it says, to humble you, that's that humbleness of coming before the Lord, allowing him to speak tenderly to us, coming into the intimacy, the, the overshadowing and the overpowering of his love, to test you where you recognize the empowerment that you have to stand against temptation, to stand against the enemy, to stand against his foul lies that he comes at you with, and then that we would discover what's in our heart. What do I have, Lord? Do I, do I have what it takes? See, God knows that you have what it takes 
to get to where he wants to take you. The question is, do you know you have what it takes? Do you know you have what it takes through the power of the Holy Spirit to break off addiction, to break off pornography, to break out of anger, to break out of depression? You have what it takes through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to walk in victory over the thing in your life that keeps you stuck in a wilderness. It goes on and it says, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you and he allowed you to hunger. He allowed you to feel the parchment of the wilderness. Again, who do we like to blame in the middle of all this? We like to blame the enemy, not recognizing that God is sovereign in this place. And God is doing a good thing inside of me, that he's humbling me. He's teaching me. He allowed me to hunger and he fed me with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know before you. Now listen to me. This word manna means what is it? And I think this is hilarious because every day as they were walking through a wilderness, something would fall on the ground and they would be like, what is it? What is that? What is this? What now, God? And a lot of times when we're walking through a wilderness, it seems like every day there's a new dose of what is it? Where am I going? What are you doing? God, are you even hearing me? That's that daily dose of what is it? And God taught them how to trust him in those what is it moments. In fact, it was the what is it that was actually feeding them. And it's in those moments that God is wanting to grow our faith. That he's feeding us and teaching us how to trust him in the middle of I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's called. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know if there's going to be any here tomorrow, but I have to trust God every day. That he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Look, God knows what is in your heart, but he wants you to know what is in your heart. He wants you to see your potential. He wants you to know that you have what it takes to get through this season and through the next season of your life. Uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Listen to it says why. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is being tested by fire, may be found. Look, there's a genuineness of your faith that God wants you to discover. There's a genuineness of your ability to persevere in faith that God wants you to discover. And he is allowing wilderness seasons in your life, in my life, in the lives of those around us, because there is a greater strength, there is a greater faith that he wants us to find, that he wants us to discover that is within us. To praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This, this phrase here, to be found, means to be discovered or to be proven. It is good for us to discover the depths of our faith and to have our faith proven, not necessarily to others and not necessarily to God, but that we would prove it to ourselves. I can't help but think about as parents, um, we look at our children, we have babies, and we know in this little itty-bitty baby is the potential to walk is the potential to sit up, is the potential to grab, hold a toy, is the potential to become a doctor, is the potential to become a singer, is the potential to run, is the potential to have great success, and we don't see it. But our job as a parent is we begin to cultivate that success and that we help them walk when the time is right. And when they're taking those first couple of steps, there's fear and there's intrepidation and they don't know their ability until they actually walk in their ability. And when they finally take those first couple of steps, their face is so excited because they had no idea that they were designed to walk. They had no idea that they were designed to run. They had no idea that they are designed to fulfill the plan and the purpose that God has in mind for them. But as a parent, you see that. And God sees that in you and he sees it in me. And so he's allowing these wilderness seasons to reveal to us what we otherwise would not know about who we are. All right, so three reasons that God sovereignly uh, allures us into wilderness seasons. 
He wants us to know the depths of his love for us. He wants to deepen our intimacy, that we would call him a husband and not a master. He wants us to recognize the empowerment that we have by the Holy Spirit to stand against the devil. And he wants us to discover the fullness of our potential that is within us. He wants you and I to know that we have what it takes. All right, this sums up episode two. Uh, don't forget to hit that notification bell. Leave me a comment. I know a lot of you have been watching, but I want to hear back from you. If you would, would be so vulnerable to share maybe a wilderness season and encourage everybody else who's watching this, uh, we learn from each other. All right, you guys, hit that notification bell, and I'll see you in episode three. Remember, enforcing purpose, it starts with you. Yeah.